Thank you for clapping now. I hope you'll clap again at the end. <laughs> we shall see. Okay, let's get set here. It's great to be able to talk to people live instead of just sort of talking into a blank monitor, which I've been doing for the last couple of years. So thank you very much for coming. So what I want to try and talk to you about today is a concept of trying to take secrets that are in your app, often hard-coded into your app, and get them out so there are no more secrets or as few secrets as possible that are at rest in your application. I'll start off by sort of explaining the context and what I see as the mobile attack surfaces that I'm looking at defending against. Uh, I'll do a little bit of hide-and-seek, kind of purple teaming, uh, how an attacker might start looking at trying to harvest those secrets, what the defenses will be. We'll go back and forth. I'll make some observations from what the current practice is um, and propose an architecture that starts to distribute and pull those secrets off the application. Um, and then I'll kind of wrap it up and, and take questions. So a little bit about me, uh, as was mentioned. Uh, I started off as a chip designer way too long ago. Um, so I was down in the process and, and low-level electrons that are moving around. I uh, started working my way up the stack, um, spent a couple of years working on reconfigurable computing where um, in the same way you think of caches and software as places to cache data, I was thinking of caching hardware pieces and on the fly reconfiguring and adding specialized hardware throughout an algorithms process to speed things up. Uh, I continued doing sort of hardware software trade-offs a big focus on extracting parallelism from code as we got more and more uh, parallel hardware available. Uh, moved up into embedded where I started working on building accelerators for cryptography. At the same time, some other colleagues in my company approved were working on uh, porting and optimizing Android uh, for a non-ARM platform that didn't quite make it to, to market, but I'm sure you've heard of it. Um, and uh, after that, we decided we wanted to do a product in uh, combining sort of the best of what we knew. We had a lot of lower level expertise and we moved into mobile and API security where we've been working for the last four or five years. So to motivate you, I just picked a, 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 a random and current event. Um, it's very easy when uh, API keys are hard coded to have them extracted. So in the last week, there's been publicity about some Shopify tokens that have been hard coded. Um, CloudSec went through and uh, just grepped looking for, for keys and found quite a few hard-coded keys and were able to use those um, to go in and access APIs. And in the, ki in the case on the right here, uh, we're actually just sending some curl commands with those hard-coded APIs and actually extracting credit card and other PII personal information through. Um, so hard-coded APIs might feel like a necessity, but they clearly can be a danger. So when I look at mobile devices and mobile applications, I kind of look at everything between the user and the back end. Um, so I'm not as interested in user authorization. I'll work with it, but I'm attempting to complement that. And I'm not as interested in what's in the deep back end security. But I'm interested in everything in between. So I want to be able to verify, is the application that's running on the device the actual application? It's the actual code. It hasn't been tampered with or modified in any way. No more or less code in the device. Um, pivoting to the runtime or the device integrity. Is the runtime safe? Is the sandbox model that's being run in Android or iOS, um, is that intact or as intact as it can be on those operating systems? Uh, and if not, what's gone wrong? What can we do about it? Um, and then pivoting into the channel itself, the communication link between the application and the back end. A lot of the value is in the back end, and today it's become more and more popular to just go ahead and do man in the middle or manipulation in the middle uh, type attacks inside the channel. So can we prevent those and detect that those are occurring? Attackers on mobile have a nice advantage in that the applications tend to be installed on a device and stay there. They're not just being served as they're needed, um, and the attacker gets to bring their own device. So they can bring a very old version of Android that hasn't got a lot of security enhancements built into it over time. Um, they can uh, corrupt whatever they want. They can play with it and use that device. So it's a pretty challenging environment to do security. So I'll walk through a little bit of back and forth, um, trying to gather some things I'm going to use as we go further. 
Um, I have been working with a modern Android app as something I've been using to, for examples. And my intention is to publish these in a, a GitHub repo or a sequence of GitHub repos so you guys can take and play that. I didn't quite get that done in time for the talk, um, but there'll be a pointer to that later on. Um, so this is kind of a, a typical app these days. It's, it's on Android. It's got Kotlin running. It's using dependency injection, Jetpack for UI and, and, uh, data. Um, and it's using a, a, a standard retrofit or OKHTP uh, networking stack. So the first attack I would do if I was going in is I would be doing static, very simple static analysis. Um, I'd be searching, grepping for high entropy strings. Strings that look random because those likely are keys that have been generated. I'll use static tools like MobSF or JDX, JADX, JDAX GUI or AndroGuard. Some of those are kind of mixed in and matched with each other. Um, I'm looking for constants. Um, they could be resource, resources in the Android app. They could be buried inside the, S, the NDK. Um, but you'd be surprised how often it, it's pretty straightforward to find these. Um, they're just sitting there, uh, and people don't uh, tend to obfuscate them. So your first defense is to use some level of obfuscation, so make it hard to comprehend what the code's doing, uh, potentially uh, encrypt or break up and slice these constants into places and put them in different places in memory or across your application. Um, you can use R8 or ProGuard on Android for that. Both are, are free. And the nice thing about um, R8 these days is that it's pretty much built in to the Android build system, so you can easily call it and use it. So you have to enable, but it's it's very straightforward to use. Um, and what you're really doing here is you're trading obscurity. How hard is it to understand what the code is doing versus the cost at runtime? So you may be adding a lot of checks, um, a lot of misdirection in your code to try and make it harder to follow the data flow. Um, that'll cost some more execution time. That'll potentially cost more energy in your application. So how far are you willing to go? The further you go, the more expensive it is, but the harder it is for an attacker to reverse engineer um, your application. Um, generally, what we found is that if something is really valuable, somebody's going to figure out how to get it, no matter how hard you go. Um, but it's a great first step to get to get things obscure and a little bit to slow down an attacker looking for secrets. So the attacker, if it's obscure, if let's say the constants split into a hundred different places around, um, they might pivot to using a debugger. And rather than trying to find all hundred pieces, they're going to run the debugger up to the point where that secret is assembled for them and about to be used, say, as an API key. And if they know the networking stack, which they can detect, they'll, they'll look around, they'll find um, the call signatures, then, then they can zero in, even in obfuscation, where it is they want to pause the debugger and start sniffing around to find those constants. Um, and uh, the other thing they can do is they can start cutting and slicing different things out. So if you have some security in the system, they can slice that out and bypass it potentially in a debugger. So the defense is to start adding runtime uh, defenses into your code. Um, so you're going to want to detect or block the running of a debugger or an attachment of a debugger or an emulator. Um, and uh, Root Beer is a reasonable product project if you want to take a look at sort of what some of the, the defense techniques that are being used. Um, you're adding more functionality into your app as you start adding these detections into your application, starting to get a little heavier. Um, and you have to be vigilant about these type tools because attackers are constantly pivoting, looking for new ways to get in. Um, so you have to make sure that your tools are evolving at the same pace that the hackers do. Um, and in many cases, it's really hard to keep up. Strengthening on this type of runtime checking, Google uh, launched SafetyNet a while back, and they've been integrating that more strongly into their Play services. Um, so it's now called Play Integrity, and the API has changed a little bit. Um, so it's a pretty decent um, way to do runtime checking, um, guarding against not just you know debuggers, but also rooting, tampering, any repackaging that's going on. So it does a number of additional checks. Um, so it's certainly a good, uh, relatively free way to get started. It does require Google Play services, so for most of the world, that's fine. But if you're in a country that does not use Google Play services, um, say China, for example, then this is uh, not as easily available to you. Um, it's free to use, um, but there is a quota on use. So you need to be a bit careful 
that you don't hit that quota and then it starts, stops working. Um, and it is relatively expensive to run. It takes a bit of time to go through all its checks. So you don't want to be using it that often. Uh, you might want to use it at launch and maybe before certain critical operations. Um, the most interesting thing to me about this is that the, um, the, the application is going to want to be uh, tested, integrity checked. It'll make a call to the API. The API will make some evaluations. Um, and then rather than just telling the application in the application, you're good or you're bad, um, it passes that back to uh, the Google service, which actually evaluates the verdict. Um, so that's interesting to me because now we've got some security decisions for the first time that are being made off device. Um, so I think that's an interesting step. Uh, other defenses you might try, if you really don't want that secret hard-coded in the device, you could try um, and ask for it. Um, and so trusting on first use, when your app is first installed on first launch, it might reach out to your service and ask, can you give me a few of the primary secrets? And it can then use those secrets, say, as decryption keys, um, to decrypt other secrets you do have hard-coded but obscured um, inside your application. Um, it assumes a lot in that it assumes that the trust is there um, on the first use. So um, manipulation in the middle, man in the middle type attacks are definitely very popular here. So um, I would launch an app with man in the middle running um, and see what I can observe in that channel. Um, so it works well unless somebody really wants to break uh, what's going on. So man in the middle, I've mentioned it a few times. Um, so if it's hard to find those secrets by doing that initial scan or doing debugging, um, then I'm going to pivot into the channel to see what I can find. Um, so I'm going to insert myself in the middle of your TLS channel. So there's a TLS handshake that goes on, um, and it's attempting to uh, establish trust from the application that it can trust that the service it's talking to is the actual server. So there's a TLS handshake that goes through. Uh, it will check the certificates that the service is presenting, and it'll start with a leaf certificate, move to an intermediate, and all the way up to a root until it finds a certificate match. Um, and uh, similar to browsers, uh, in, the in the Android device, there's a trust store that holds a series of, of root certificates. So it will walk up that chain until it finds one that matches. The problem with that is that, especially on older versions of Android, uh, a very common attack is to go ahead and create a phony certificate, uh, the one in pink here, and um, to go ahead and try and insert that into the Android uh, trust store. So it will go ahead and insert that in so that when the man in the middle is presenting a cert certificate that says, I, I am your service, trust me, um, the Android operating system will dutifully look in the trust store, walk through those certificates, find the polluted certificates that have been inserted and say, hey, I'm good, I see it, it's great. So once you're in, you're in, you can observe all that traffic because you're going to be able to just decrypt the, S, the, the traffic that's coming through the TLS channel, um, re-encrypt it as you send it to the real backend, manipulate it in, in any directions you want. So very popular attack strategy. How do you defend it against it? Uh, a common technique is certificate pinning. Um, and here we're going to say, you know, I don't really trust that, that device uh, trust store. Um, so I'm going to take the, the exact certificate that I expect the service to present, um, and I'm going to um, hash the public key that's in that certificate. That's the most common approach that's used. Um, so that's now sitting inside the app as another constant that's there. Um, so that this time when the, the man in the middle attacker presents a certificate, uh, it would pass the the operating system trust store, but it will not match the fingerprint, the, the hashed public key, um, that should have been presented. Um, so it'll reject that, um, and that's known as certificate pinning. Certificate pinning is not as popular as I think it should be, um, in part because certificates, certificates expire. And when they expire, all of a sudden your app is bricked, 
it can't communicate anymore. Um, and your only alternative, if you want to upgrade to a new certificate, is to go ahead and uh, rebuild your app with the new secret and do a full install to your field that's going through. So the attacker, of course, is going to try and bypass cert certificate pinning. How do they do that? Um, instrumentation frameworks are um, uh, were, were developed so that we can get really inside applications and observe what's going on. They're wonderful tools for hackers. Um, they enable you to get in and hook functions uh, with hopefully without being detected. You're not actually modifying the installed code, but you're actually hooking these functions and replacing them at runtime. Um, Frida is a very popular framework for doing this. An objection wraps a lot of Frida and makes it very easy to use. And there's a whole class of libraries that you can get access to for doing bypassing of certificate pinning. Um, so in the case of objection, for example, you run objection, it'll look at the APK, decompile it, figure out, okay, it looks like the networking stack you're using is okay HTTP, so I'm going to apply this sequence um, to go ahead and replace the function call and intercept that, and, and you're off to the races. Um, the more uh, obfuscation is in there, the harder that gets. So I might have to do a little bit of work to figure out um, what's the signature call that's been masked, but the parameter, the signature, um, is still the same. So I'll find a, a certificate pinning signature, uh, and I'll go ahead and direct Frida right in there to hook that. Um, it's a little bit harder, but not that much. Um, so there, if, if you can get an instrumentation framework in without being detected, then you can go ahead and, and unpin, and you're off to the races. Oh, if you are interested in looking at this, I did um, point to uh, an interesting article. It's a few years old, but it does do a really good job in, in a single article of kind of setting the context for how someone would do that. You have some alternate defenses to harden the channel. If you don't want to use certificate pinning, they're not as strong, uh, but they're definitely useful. First of all, rather than passing that API key itself, you can use that API key as a signature and sign, say, a short-lived JWT uh, token. Uh, it, in that case, the token would be in the channel and could be grabbed by an, a man-in-the-middle attack. But the, the secret itself is not in the channel. Only the token that was signed by it is. So if you grab that token, and let's say that token's uh, uh, valid for 15 minutes, then you can use that to rampage around for 15 minutes, but at least you can't use it forever. Uh, it's going to have a short lifetime. Um, so that's a good start. Um, you can also add additional encryption if you on top of the, um, the TLS channel, um, so that even if the TLS channel is compromised and you decrypt that layer, there's yet another layer of encryption above, so you'll just see that layer of encryption. Um, this requires you to add yet another constant and some additional functionality into your application. So you're building up a lot of machinery and a lot of secrets inside your application. And this will go on and on and on, um, with attackers trying to do this and defenders trying to do that as they go through. Um, but there's some interesting points that hopefully we're going to build on as we go through. So some observations. What I find interesting when I go through this is first that I can add code into an application um, to observe and do some sort of meta detection kind of information. Just being able to do that is great and, and pretty important. Um, I look at Tofu and I, I don't like the fact that I'm sort of saying, yeah, I trust you. Uh, on first use, but what I do like is that the secrets are being pulled remotely into the application. So they're no longer hard coded into the application to start. So that's an interesting thing to me. I again like the fact that play integrity is making a decision or at least evaluating a verdict off the device as well. So now we're making some security decisions, not all buried in the application, but we're going out, um, say, into another server, which would be very hard for an attacker to get into, to make some part of the security evaluation as you go through. Um, and I do like using JWTs so that when all else fails, at least I haven't given away the secret uh, directly. What I find annoying is that the more detection I need to do, the heavier the impact on the application gets. I'm adding more secrets. I'm adding more functionality. Um, and 
those darn attackers keep finding new ways to do things. So I keep having to keep pace with what's going on. Um, keep having to add new or refine detection capabilities. I um, mean, as I mentioned, I like tofu, but I don't like the fact that I have to trust that it's, that it's true. So I want to make an analogy to user authorization. Um, when we authenticate our users, do we manage user authentication by hard loading, hard coding a list of users into the application, defending the heck out of it to make sure they can't find them and forcing an app update every time I want to add a new user? Not really, right? We delegate that uh, that service to an outside entity. Um, that way, adding users, changing passwords, changing authentication fingerprints, that all can be done up in the cloud without impacting the app. And you accept that. You use something like OAuth, and it works very well. And I wouldn't want to do any kind of hard-coded user authentication anymore. Probably did that a long time ago. So why do we do the same thing for the secrets that we're trying to protect? So um, what I'm proposing um, and how I look at advancing this is I don't want any secrets in the application. I want them off in the cloud somewhere. I don't want them ever to be at rest inside the app. I don't want them hard-coded in the code. I don't want them stored in some secure storage area. I also want to minimize the amount of functionality in the app. So how much of the detection capability that's there can I get off the app and out into the cloud so that decisions, just like they were with Play Integrity, were being made off the app? Um, and once I've got stuff up in the cloud where I can access it, how much can I update things on the fly? Can I change a key easily? Um, can I update the, the security functionality easy? If it's up in the cloud, maybe there's some things that I can do there. So this is the architecture I'm proposing. Um, it's an architecture actually our company uses, so I believe in it pretty strongly. Um, this is our, our food application, which we're using as the sample here. Um, and I've created an app authentication service. Um, it has a signing key. That's the dollar signs that are there. Um, and basically, when an application wants to make an API call, it's going to go ahead and request to be attested or checked to see, am I safe? Um, it'll make that request to the service. The service will come back and salt some things and basically ask for measurements. So there's an SDK that would be installed here that doesn't contain all the security, but it contains just the measurement capabilities. So provide measurements of what's going on in the application up to the app auth service. And the app auth service will actually make the decision as to whether this application appears to be safe or not. If it's safe, it will return a JWT token that's properly signed, could be valid for a very short period of time. The SDK will intercept the networking call. In this case, the uh, OKHTTP OK stack would use just a basic OKHTTP OK interceptor. Um, add that token just like a user authentication token. In fact, the two could be bound together if you wanted to. Um, and that token would pass with the API over into the back end where a back-end gateway would check and make sure that the token is alive, um, it will be a short-lived token, and that it's been properly signed. So with that architecture, what do we get? So if you want to make a first-party API call, an API call to your back-end service, I pretty much just described that scenario already. So um, in that case, if the app attests cleanly, you're going to get a properly signed JWT token. If there's been something bad going on, those measurements don't measure up when the decision is being made, um, then you'll still get issued a token, but it will be improperly signed. The application itself doesn't actually need to evaluate whether this token is healthy or, or unhealthy. It's going to take that, pass it on, and your back end is going to decide whether to accept or reject the API. How easy is it to change the signing secret? Well, it's pretty easy. All you have to do is an operations guy can call up to this service and say, I want to replace my secret. Um, so that's a separate channel, nowhere near the app, um, and very easy to change the secret from dollar signs to euros, um, and you're done. And as soon as any instance of the app has to be attested, that new secret's going to be used to sign the tokens that are going to be the result of that. So you, in essence, are changing the key, and it's rolled out to your entire um, population of, of users as each app is used. 
But what if you want to make a third-party call, API call? So rather than having a backend that you control specific, let's say you want to make a call to Google Maps or something uh, that you don't necessarily control, you're not going through your gateway as a proxy to that service, um, which is uh, a, a perfectly viable strategy. But let's say you want to make that call directly. Um, then now when it attests, in addition to the token being passed down, it's going to pass the current API key down as well. Um, and assuming that you attested cleanly, you'll get both. If if you don't attest cleanly, then you won't get to see what the API key is. So that gets passed down. Um, and rather than adding the token, you would go ahead and make whatever the style of, of API call that is necessary with the API key or whatever secrets you need to complete that call. Need to change that API key because Google Maps had a problem or something and they needed to pivot the key on you? Um, you can do it instantly because all you're doing is changing it in the cloud as opposed to having to go and fix it down in the app and, and reissuing the app through. Um, remote secret storage is another uh, possibility with this architecture. So if you can generate a unique ID for each instance that's installed, um, and that ID is durable, say, over installations on that device, then you can uh, use that to identify individual instances, and you can establish reading and writing of these secrets rather than to secure storage on the device, you can actually use that to read and write up into the approved service. So now you have sort of cloud-based storage, <coughs> excuse me, of the um, of the secrets that you want to use. So if you have addi additional, <coughs> excuse me, specialized secrets, then um, you can use those, assuming that you've established trust by the attestation. So assuming that you have uh, established a valid uh, uh, app auth token um, that goes down, then you can read and write these secrets. So comparing this to Tofu, trust on first use, um, I've, I've relabeled, it, relabeled it taboo. So now we're trusting authentication before each use as you go through. Um, so I've established trust rather than sort of having to pray on first use that things are going to work out okay. Certificate pinning. Um, the scary part about certificate pinning is that certificates, certificates, excuse me, certificates expire and brick apps. Uh, this certificate is kind of another constant. So you can manage it up in the cloud. Um, so now if a certificate uh, expires, your app won't be able to communicate to your back end or to your third party APIs. Um, but there's a separate channel uh, out to the app off service. So you can go ahead and rotate your, your certificates, add certificates as often as you want, um, and they'll be immediately picked up again, assuming that you've established trust in the application, that the application is clean and can receive an update. Signing message, same story. If you want to sign a message or you want to add some encryption onto a message, you've got yet another constant, but you're going to store it up in the cloud and assuming the trust is there, then you'll go ahead and download that in. And you might begin to add some functionality inside the SDK, um, say to do the message signing or to do um, the encryption here, just to ensure sort of good hygiene of the secret. So it, you, the uh, user doesn't accidentally read the secret and put it somewhere in storage um, going on. So. Another advantage you get in this uh, architecture is that you can change your security policy or your security um, posture on the fly. Um, so we've split the decisions and the measurements. So um, you'll continue on the device each time you're testing it to take that same set of measurements that are being requested. Um, that information is fed up to the decision. But what decision you make can be influenced not just by the measurements, but how tight and strictly you want the security to be. So you could want to block routing, and routing will be detected, and the decision making will say, okay, that's no good, I'm blocking that, um, and it'll issue a bad token. Um, but you could decide, well, you know, this is a game, and I'm seeing a high population of my users have modded their phones, um, so I don't want to block routing. 
So you'll go ahead and detect it in the measurements, but your security posture will be, I'm going to allow that to pass. So even though nothing has, has changed in the measurements, I'm now going to provide a valid uh, attestation or APOTH token back into your device. And you can change that on the fly the same way that you can change any of these keys. Uh, the good news, though, is that you're still detecting everything that's going on, and you're collecting a lot of data about your application's population and use and who's trying to hack it and how they're trying to hack it by what you detect. So um, over on the right, you see just some uh, typical trace data. We'd see this is a 24, actually it's a two-day window. Um, you can see on the upper, these are, on the upper graph, there are, um, it's going up during the day and usage is going down. These are all passes. Um, the bottom graph is showing failures. They're trending about the same way. Um, and actually, this is a financial app that's being run and it's uh, about 10% of the traffic is traffic probing, hacking, trying to get in. Can they get in and, and attack this payments app? Can we use it somehow to launder money or whatever they're trying to do there? Um, so quite a high volume. And we typically see between 5 and 10%, depending on the, the style of application that's going on there, for a popular app that's going through. Um, this application is running uh, about... Uh, 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 a, a couple million, five million kind of active users um, per month. So um, so a lot of information there and a lot of forensics that you can use as a result. So just to summarize, um, I, I said in my talk that we were looking to try and establish the mobile application security verification standard resilience. Um, there are um, sort of three layers to this uh, verification standard, um, resiliency being the, the top one. So the, this is Section 8, and there's a bunch of different sections in it. Um, so um, I, our contention, my contention, is that resilience is strongly strengthened by having secrets never be allowed to rest inside the application, splitting the measurement from the verdict, from the attestation decision, um, and adding live updating gives you a whole bunch of benefits. Um, versus the traditional approach of stuffing everything into the application. So in the first um, number of, of um, items in the MP dynamic analysis and tampering section, um, all the detections that they want to see, rooting, um, uh, emulator detection, debuggers, instrumentation frameworks, those all can be added in this technique. You can split the measurement from the decision for all those detection capabilities. Um, and then there's an interesting one right at the end of this section talking about can you split the detection and the response, or can you be kind of stealthy with what you do? Um, and it's interesting because we've split the measurement from the decision, and the decision's actually made not even on the device. Um, so that's a very strong separation there um, that you wouldn't typically see in a traditional kind of defense. Um, device binding, we use unique IDs. We can generate unique IDs. Um, they can be added into this kind of um, capability. Um, once you do that, you can individually, you can address individual instances um, with what's going on, and you could even say, change a security policy where these devices are being used for test. Let's just have the security policy be always pass, you, you know, no matter what. And you can just get the security on the device out of the way. Um, as I mentioned earlier, once you have those IDs, you can bind secrets to individual instances. So let's say um, you grab your game, you grab the user uh, OAuth token for user authentication. You want to keep it for three months so the guy doesn't have to re-log in. You want to store that somewhere. Well, that's three months in an application where it could be harvested. Um, instead, we can pull it off into the remote storage uh, because we can address individual devices um, and use it as needed there. So it, it's not at rest in the device. Can we impede comprehension with this? Um, well, there's a little twist here um, in that the SDK itself is small. We try to get as much stuff out of the application as possible. So you can go in and, and uh, obfuscate and shield and harden that SDK as much as you want. The rest of the application, you don't need to, uh, to do. You can do it if you want. I would recommend you do. Um, but there's a separation here between the actual machinery in the SDK, which can be just 
heavily shielded, and then you can shield what you want. So you don't have to pay the overhead of a full obfuscation if you don't want to. Um, and do we impede eavesdropping the last section? Well, um, we're, we're providing certificate pinning assistance um, with this technique, and we can change pins on the fly. So you can set up rotation policies. You can use a service to constantly be checking, um, is my certificate still valid? If it's not, you can actually find the correct certificate and download it to your application so your users don't even necessarily see much of a hiccup if somehow a certificate does expire briefly. Um, message encryption, same thing. You're still, you're getting a little bit of strength by the fact that these secrets are not sitting, um, at rest in the device. So I'm trying to convince you that getting stuff, secrets, and decision making capability on your, your secrets is a service kind of like user authentication is a service. And it's interesting to treat it like that. So we can remove secrets from the application code, from the need to put them into a secure storage, alternatively. Um, and we've minimized the security footprint inside your application by stating that we're going to measure the least amount of information we need in the SDK, and then we're going to make the decision off device. Um, it's a lot harder to hack that decision capability. You might, if it's on the device, you might have used Frida to try and hook a call that says, Am I good to go? And if you can hook it and say, oh yeah, just say it is, then you've defeated all the, the um, security detection capability. If it's sitting off in the cloud, it's a lot harder to get in there, figure out what's going on, do it, and do it in the right synchronization with everything that's going on here. Virtually impossible. Um, we've added the capability to do a lot more live updating of the security that's going on. So it's trivial to change secrets. Your operations guys can go ahead and change secrets in the service on the fly, and they immediately get used and passed down to all the application instances that require them. Um, in addition, you also can update the security capabilities here. Um, to update decision-making, that's pretty easy, because that's just up in the cloud, so you just have to do that. You only have to do that in one place, as opposed to rolling out New security into a many, many different application instances. Um, the SDK itself, the question is, can you update the measurement capabilities in that device? Now, you can't sort of download a new SDK with a lot of DEX code in it for Android. That goes against the Play Store policies. But what you could do is create a measurement machine or a measurement virtual machine inside the SDK, and you can add capabilities by sort of configuring additional observation capabilities into it. So it's kind of, is it data? Is it code? It, it's downloading a configuration in there. It looks like data, so it doesn't violate any of the, um, the Play Store and App Store capabilities. So you do have the ability, assuming the, in the device attests is correct, to get some additional measurement capabilities download it into the SDK, or at least a set of signatures, a list of signatures, or something like that to go through. So not only can you change secrets, but you can also upgrade the security functionality um, via the measurement or via detection enhancements up in the service. Um, you also get lots of live telemetry with this kind of setup, because it, when API calls are being made, um, you're going ahead and requesting for the service to make a decision for you. Um, you're providing a lot of measurement data up to that service, which will aggregate that and, and um, show you exactly what's being detected, whether or not it's actually choosing to fail the device as a security policy decision, but you still have access to all that data. Um, and you can, add, you can imagine using the JWT tokens that are coming down to add information and payload so you can trace things and do a lot of forensics with that. So a lot of interesting capabilities coming up by just sort of mimicking a user authentication type architecture with the application authentication type security architecture. So as I said, I, I've been working on um, putting this all into a repo so everyone can, can play with these kind of techniques. Uh, I bit off a little more than I can chew, so um, there is a, a sort of virtually empty GitHub repo that's sitting here um, in my public uh, GitHub account. So if you're interested in looking at that, just go there. It'll, uh, you can either contact me if you want to be updated about it, or you can just watch that repo if you don't want to, uh, to 
identify to me who you are. And um, if it's of use to you, I'll be working hard to get that up as soon as I can. So with that, I'm looking forward to lots of questions. I'll come. Uh, I was just wondering how much of that applies to iOS as well. iOS, um, it's perfectly similar. Um, with safety net and with um, play integrity, there are analogs in the iOS space. It's interesting the two operating systems kind of have a different history of how they came to this attestation thing. But on iOS, you should look at app attestation or app attest, I think it's called. Um, and device check is historically like safety net. Um, so uh, there, there uh, is nothing stopping you from doing exactly the same thing on iOS. Um, instead of Dexcode, you're, you're obviously dealing with a different runtime environment. Um, and in fact, one of the things you can do is you can unify the interfaces in something like this SDK across both. So if you're working in um, Android and iOS, you don't have to learn two separate systems, and you'll see iOS's attestation techniques and Androids are quite different. Um, if you're doing something like uh, uh, React Native or a Xamarin or a Maui where uh, everything is done underneath, again, you'll have Android and iOS SDKs that are doing the same thing in those different environments. Um, and in those kind of cases, that's all could be handled transparently. Uh, with the additional outbound calls the app has to make, is there any impact to performance at all? Um, it's a good question. So um, I didn't really go into, um, I, I sort of glibly jumped over the fact that I said, oh, you'll just make an att attestation to every a API call. I also said that things like um, Google's Play Integrity is a fairly expensive call. Um, so you need to um, be able to extract those measurements and get them across very quickly. Um, a practical experience to do a full measurement um, for either Android and iOS is running uh, in what, what we see is around 100 milliseconds. And then you have uh, two, typically two round trips uh, per call. The app will ask to be attested and then the service will, will come back with some nonces and things um, to to block replay attacks and things such as that. Then the measurements come, then the decision comes back. So you have two round trip delays, which will uh, often be the, the time limiting. So you probably don't want to actually do this every API call, um, and you'll use uh, the lifetime of the JWT token that's gonna be there to set how often you would do that. Um, so you might have a JWT token valid for five minutes, so um, you'd make your first API call, and you would attest, get a token, you'd suffer the two round trips, um, and then if you're actively making calls, you'll, you'll just use that same token until it expires, and then you'll need to do another attestation. And you can hide those kind of latencies. So the penalty is pretty small, but you're not going to want to do it on every API call. Over here. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, I can be loud. Maybe that works. Yeah, I'll get it. Hi, Skip. Uh, thanks for the very interesting talk. Um, I wondered, are there any limits to the reach of the integrity check that is used for the attestation? Sorry, limits to what? Limits to the scope of the integrity in terms of the, the application. So. Uh, application can comprise many parts? So, um, e yes, um, e in that there's no difference between making a measurement that's passed to a service versus making a measurement uh, on the device and decisions made on the device. It's still those same measurements. Um, but what I should say is that in this technique, you're going to focus on detection and not necessarily prevention. So. I, I, with this technique, I'm not going to stop you 
from um, trying to hack the device. But I'm going to detect that you did, and I'm going to block you from getting to your back end, because your back end is where all the value is. Um, other techniques will attempt to uh, do more runtime self-protection, um, to actually harden the apps and put a lot in there so that you can't get through um, until you do. But um, uh, that's not something this technique is, is attempting to do. Thank you. Any skeptics out there? Really hard, nasty questions? <laughs> so do we have any questions? Yeah, yeah, let's oh. come to you. Okay, here it comes. <laughs> no, I, I like your design and I agree with it, but the sort of questions we get from our user base are privacy-related questions. Mm -hmm. So all this info, they'll see all this info being uploaded to the big bad cloud and they want to know why and they'll want us to justify it. And that's the problem. So uh, addressing that problem, the only piece of information that I require is a unique ID per app instance. Uh, I'm not gathering any other personal information, um, but I am gathering that ID so that I can correlate as we go through and match things up. Um, so uh, when when we use, for, for our own product, we generate unique IDs and we have to discuss that with customers and make sure that that's acceptable. Um, and we've never had an issue with it once we've sat down and explained everything through. Um, everything is being hashed and going through and anonymized, so there's, there's no way you could reverse engineer any kind of data that was used in the decision. Um, it is possible, since I'm offering you a remote sort of secrets capability by allowing you to store some information that we talked about those long-term user access tokens up in the cloud, it's possible that a application developer could use that to uh, inadvertently store some PIA up there, so that would have to be checked um, because that would not be something we would want to see. Um, but it's the same like the opening example I showed you with the Shopify situation where Shopify provided you a valuable service and a valuable interface, but the application developers went ahead and hard-coded those APIs without API keys without defending them. So those keys leaked and information could be attacked as a result. Um, so you provide what you can, but you also need to check the application developers are still following good hygiene practice. Do we have any more questions? Come on, guys. If you don't okay. ask any more questions, you're going to have to go to lunch. <laughs> so, uh, thank you, Skip. Okay. For a very engaging talk. And uh, can I request the audience to give him a round of applause for him, too? <laughs> <laughs>